Hello, I'm Dallas Pounds and I'm Director of Services for Lymphoma Action. Hello, I'm Dr Wendy Osborne and I'm a consultant haematologist in Newcastle. We're here today to talk about DLBCL, Diffuse Large B Cell Lymphoma and the treatment landscape. It's great to be here with you, Wendy. So could you start off by telling us a little bit about what is DLBCL? Well, we know that there are nearly a hundred different subtypes of lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the commonest B-cell lymphoma and we actually see about 5,000 patients diagnosed in the UK every year. So it is a common lymphoma and it's in the sort of categorization of high-grade lymphoma, which means that we usually have to treat patients quite quickly within a short number of weeks to months but often we would expect to cure the lymphoma or get rid of the lymphoma for good, certainly in optimistically about 60 to 70% of our patients. Wendy, we know that even though two people may have the same diagnosis, the treatment they receive and the options for them might be different, but could you talk to us a little bit about what the treatment options are for people with DLBCL? So the decisions will depend on whether the patient is presenting first line or whether they have unfortunately relapsed and refractory disease. And in a first line setting, most patients have standard chemoimmunotherapy and the numbers of cycles they will receive will depend upon whether they have early stage, which is stage one or two, or advanced stage, stage three or four disease. If our patient has early stage disease, then we would usually aim to give them just three or four cycles of chemotherapy, and sometimes we will consolidate that with radiotherapy, a so-called combined modality approach. Whereas for our patients with advanced stage disease, we would usually give six cycles of chemoimmunotherapy. Sometimes we need to consolidate that with radiotherapy, and for some patients we give additional chemotherapy as well as CNS prophylaxis. So the chemotherapy approach is quite similar in a first line setting, but for some patients, maybe those who are less fit or have significant comorbidities, we may have to give a less intensive chemotherapy approach. When we have our patients in a relapsed or refractory setting, the, the pathway is a lot more varied and that will depend upon um, patient fitness for treatment, about time from relapse, and it will also depend about what the patient wants because mm -hmm. some patients are a lot more intensive, needing a lot of inpatient admission time. Some patients um, will need to travel for certain more specialized treatments. So it's quite a lot that we need to discuss with our patients. If we think about it broadly, if our patients relapse within 12 months, and they meet the eligibility, then we would offer them CAR-T treatment, so a cellular therapy treatment. Mm -hmm. If they relapse longer than 12 months and they are fit enough, we would give them high-dose intensive chemotherapy with an autologous stem cell transplant, so very intensive treatment. And then for our patients who aren't able to have either of these treatments, we would give them different second-line chemoimmunotherapy and that would probably often need to take them to a third line treatment option. And then again, there's more options, which is fantastic for our patients. So we can now talk to our patients CAR T third line, if they've not had it second line, by specific antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, or further chemoimmunotherapy. And then fourth line, we could use any of those third line options that we haven't already used. And so this now means that sometimes we're offering up to five or six lines of treatment for our patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And if somebody has a diagnosis of DLBCL, or indeed they're a family member or a friend of somebody, how might they make themselves well informed, educate themselves about the, the blood cancer so they can be active in the decision making? Yes, yeah, so I think that this is also really important. So, I mean, I think as clinicians, we're very keen to make sure that we give our patients written patient information at diagnosis, both about the subtype of lymphoma, so we give them the specific subtype booklet, and we give them written information about the chemotherapy we plan to give and about radiotherapy if that's also within the treatment plan. 
I think that what's really important as well is the additional support that our patients get from um, other health professionals, particularly our clinical nurse specialists. They are of huge importance in terms of giving um, and discussing further information with patients and our day unit nurses who often deliver the chemotherapy and other um, sites such as websites and many of our patients um, certainly look on the Lymphoma Action website for this support. So I think that information is really important for patients but what I also think is and what patients tell me is that trying to not give too much information all in one go. It's a big shock when you're telling someone they've got cancer and sometimes you can have a long conversation and then when you see the patient back the following week in clinic, they'll say, actually, I couldn't even listen and think about everything else you've said. So I think about making sure that that information is accessible at a time point which is most helpful for the patient is really important. And that is why the written information is important, online information is important, phone access to nurse specialists is important because Although we have sort of standard treatment and plans for our patients, we do need to make sure that our patients are involved in the decision making for their, their treatment plan. Yeah, and this is really important, isn't it? At Lymphoma Action, we hear from a lot of people who need that information in bite-sized chunks when they're ready for it in a format that they can understand. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you.